Thanks, Eric. Friends, Ben Shapiro, founder and editor emeritus of The Daily Wire, host of The Ben Shapiro Show. The man is incapable of writing a book that doesn't become a New York Times bestseller. Ben Shapiro is one of the most popular conservative voices in the United States. And while he spends most of his time as a writer and as a media host, we should also see him as a kind of teacher. Ben Shapiro is, of course, not a university professor, but perhaps more than anyone else in the country, he has, through his mastery of new forms of media and his ubiquitous presence on campus, he has stimulated, in the young, a conservative way of thinking about public affairs. Another of the speakers at this year's conference, Matthew Consonetti, author of a forthcoming book about conservatism, has written in National Review that in his prolific output, forensic zeal and ability, love of the fray, exhaustive schedule, adoption of new communications platforms, captive audience, and conservative ecumenicism, Ben Shapiro resembles no one so much as the young William F. Buckley. Ben Welcome to the Jewish Leadership Conference's 2021 conference on Jews and conservatism. Thank you so much for having me. And we're joined by Leon Cass, formerly of the University of Chicago's Committee on Social Thought and the American Enterprise Institute. Leon is currently Dean of Faculty at Shalem College, Israel's first and best American-style liberal arts college, where he builds on a distinguished career of writing and teaching great books, philosophy, literature, civics, and following his earlier commentary on Genesis, he's the author of the recently released commentary on Exodus, Founding God's Nation. Leon Cass, teacher of the good and the beautiful, along with the righteous and reverential, you honor us with your presence. Welcome. Thanks very much, John. Nice to be with you and nice to be with Ben. Well, Ben, the premise of your 2019 book, The Right Side of History, is that there's something amiss in America, something wrong that is deeper than our politics, that to solve our political problems, we need to look outside and underneath the foundation of our culture. I'd like to start not in ancient Egypt, but here in the United States, and understand what kind of disorders you see. Well, I mean, I think the chief disorder is that in essence, there's a God-shaped hole in the American heart, and we're seeking to fill it with everything but God. We're seeking to fill it with culture. We're seeking to fill it with, with hedonism. We're seeking to fill it with politics, most prominently. Uh, and the, the sort of zeal and passion that we feel uh, on behalf of political causes is not likely to provide the sort of fulfillment that's going to lead to either happiness on the individual level or health on a societal level. And you can see that happening in nearly every institution in our country. And you can see the, how, how we're fragmenting as a society, and I think that's because we just don't talk about values uh, in, a, in a godly way, I would say, but, but just as importantly, um, in, a, in a natural law way. There, there's no actual common foundation for anything that we are discussing at this point. We've all retreated into the, the problems associated with, with self-expression and self-identity, as opposed to trying to find some common set of values, some common language that we can use to, to speak with each other. For thousands of years, that language in the West was the, the sort of combination of Jerusalem and Athens that, that so many philosophers have talked about, including most prominently Leo Strauss. But, the, but th that is sort of passed by the wayside, and, and now nobody studies either Jerusalem or Athens. Both are considered passe. And so we're basically fighting with each other at this point over, over the table scraps of, of identity politics. Leon, with those disorders in mind, Ben says that we're missing something in our culture. And so let's turn to the great fundamental text that can perhaps supply some of what we lack. We should, of course, read Exodus on its own terms and try to understand it the way that its compilers wanted us to understand it. But we should also see if there's something it can teach us about how a nation comes together. How is a nation formed? Well, uh, I, I think that's, uh, that's really a very welcome way of putting it. I mean, if you read the book of Exodus, uh, for its historical value, you get the account of the decisive events in the foundation of the Israelite nation, one of history's most consequential people, um, and uh, with a teaching that, as Ben says, until fairly recently was the moral bedrock of the West. Um, and if you go back and look at Exodus, what you see is the foundation of the people of Israel 
as narrated in the book of Exodus, rests really on three pillars. First of all, enslavement in Egypt and miraculous deliverance, which becomes the national narrative reenacted every year at Passover by a command to so reenact this story that was given to the children of Israel even before they were delivered. So they go out already thinking about their children and their children's children and the story that has to be told. So number one, a national narrative. Number two, law and morality given at Sinai in the context of a covenant to become uh, uh, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, a wonderful mission for these ex-slaves who see the possibility here that they will have an important place in human history. And then finally, the third pillar uh, in, for which the law given, the, the, the Ten Commandments and the ordinances are insufficient, uh, the tabernacle and Mishkan, where the people will gather together in expressions of gratitude and in search for atonement to become close to God, uh, who says that he liberated these people, in fact, so that he might dwell in their midst. So national narrative, law and morality, and an opportunity to address the human longing to be in touch with what is highest. Um, and these things uh, turn out to be um, not just of ancient interest and not just of interest to Jews, but interest to any nation that is to be uh, long, uh, to, 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 to long endure. Um, to have a national story which is shared, to have a common law and morality, and in fact to uh, aspire to something beyond just our comfort and safety. And I think as Ben says, we now live in a world where that story is contested if not despised by an elite, if the law and mores are not somehow in tatters, and in which it's not clear what if anything higher than our own prosperity we aspire to. Ben, to what extent do you think that the wisdom of Exodus could apply to us in the United States? There is, of course, a commonly held view that citizens of the United States are not really part of a nation in the way that term is sometimes understood, because ours is a creedal, provisional arrangement that's not based on the more encompassing ethnic identities of Europe or the Middle East. America, according to this way of thinking, is a state of many nations, with Americans hailing from every country on the planet, all somehow equally American. Now, is this way of thinking about national cohesion that uh, is bound upon, that is bound up in the law given to the Israelites, which are, after all, a chosen people, uh, people that grew out of the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Is that condition relevant to ours? I really do, in, in a lot of ways. Number one, I think it's important to recognize that in the book of Exodus, the, the people of Israel, while we get their origin story in, in the book of Genesis, by the time we get to Exodus, this is a subservient people. It's a, it's a slavish people. It's a people who are rebellious against their own leadership. It is not a good people. Uh, the people of Israel, by the time they are brought out of the land of Israel, I mean, the, the commentaries suggest they're at the 49th level of Tuma. They're, they're at the nearly the lowest level, almost at the unredeemable level of sin uh, before they are brought out. So certainly taking such inauspicious beginnings and then making that the covenantal people is a choice by God. In fact, uh, it's a choice that is eventually ratified by Moses. It takes the entire book of Exodus, as Leon points out in his book, it takes the entire book of Exodus for Moses to actually identify himself with the people because he finds them <laughs> so off-putting. It's really interesting how the, the three elements that, that Professor Cass talks about there uh, align so deeply with, with things that I think America lacks. So he talks about the idea of a national origin story, the idea of law and morality, and then the idea of, uh, of seeking something higher, higher values. Uh, in, in the book that I wrote most recently, How to Destroy America in Three Easy Steps, that, that sort of aligns with the three things I think America's missing right now. We don't have a shared sense of our own history and our own experience. We have instead a fragmented sense of our own history where, where some of us are victims and some of us are victimizers. Uh, and that can, that's an irrevocable, bre an irrevocable breach that can never be brought back together. We lack a sense of law and morality or, or even a culture of law and morality in which we agree on certain mores, certain social standards, uh, things that we all have to agree to in order for us to have a common society. You're seeing things like freedom of speech, which is more of a cultural totem of America. But th that's falling apart 
uh, which you know, in a Jewish context would be as though people started abrogating the Ten Commandments. Uh, and then finally, in terms of the, the sort of seeking God aspect of Exodus, the, the notion that there has to be something higher that we're seeking, there used to be a higher philosophy in the United States also that was embodied in, in certain principles of the, of the Declaration of Independence, rights that spring from on high and pre-exist government in the first place. We've discarded those as well. So if we've discarded the, the things that are necessary to build a nation, that would seem to suggest that we need to revivify our sense of what it was that builds nations in the first place. Because I do think that there is a universal message to Exodus that has been recognized over a wide variety of cultures uh, since, since Exodus was written. Well, Leon, it strikes me that there was a time in American history when our national self-understanding did draw inspiration from the Exodus story, that we saw a reenactment in our national life of that same journey from oppression to journey through the wilderness to finally uh, arriving in a condition of liberty under the law. I'm not sure we've done a very good job of passing that self-understanding on. Um, look, that's the question of questions. I mean, a culture uh, is built up um, over decades, over centuries. Um, it's not generally done by some uh, will of, of a small group of people to impose it. It's very easy to tear it down. It's very hard to rebuild it. I mean, maybe there will be another great awakening. Um, maybe the conversations of the sort that we're having here um, will inspire various people to look again at the sources of our strength, both biblical and American. Uh, the material is there, and uh, if one learned one's own history properly, one it's not all that far away. Um, uh, a couple of examples from the past and a couple examples even from my own lifetime. Um, look, uh, the, the, the analogy to uh, ancient Israel was on the minds of the Puritans who came here escaping religious oppression. Um, they, the Mayflower Compact is in a way the first political document preceding the Declaration of Independence by, uh, what, 156 years. Uh, this is a covenant which they swore to each other in the presence of God, and they established themselves as a people aboard ship before they had an economy, before they had a land very much like the children of Israel in the desert. Um, uh, all kinds of people saw an analogy between the United States uh, and, its, um, and its moral mission in the world. Uh, Lincoln spoke of, of, of the Americans as an almost chosen people, um, and, um, and, and Melville made the, the analogy very explicit. One of the things that, uh, to come forward, one of the things that the America of my youth had, which we've now lost, is a sense of the liturgy of the American calendar. The holidays were not set up like the Jewish holidays, uh, which were very explicitly the taking of agricultural celebrations of, of, of first fruits, of harvest, of pl planting first fruits and harvest, and turning them into the holidays celebrating deliverance, the holidays celebrating the giving of the Torah, the holiday remembering the living in the booths, and so on. Uh, we have a national calendar, too, in which our story used to be celebrated um, and celebrated with speeches, with remembrances, and so on. At a certain point, uh, the national calendar was sort of subverted with minor exceptions. Memorial Day still has some kind of, 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 of expression of reverence and appreciation of those who sacrifice their lives for our freedoms. But for the most part, we've turned these into three-day weekends and uh, uh, mattress day sales. Uh, and one could begin to recover something of what, the, what, what, the, what, what America owes to, the, to not only the, the, the Declaration of Independence, but the acknowledgments of dependence in Thanksgiving. One knows what one owes really to the immigrant experience and in fact to the, the courage of the founders that used to be celebrated in Columbus Day. One has two holidays of uh, touching on, on, on veterans which could be treated really um, 
in a, in a much more elevated way. Compare this to what the Israelis do. The Israelis have back-to-back -back Yom HaZikaron, which is our Memorial Day, and the very next day is Yom HaAtzma'ut, the declaration of independ the, 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 the celebration of independence. And the Israelis know by this juxtaposition what it took to provide the independence and the gratitude and, and the gratitude is right there connected with the celebration. We have this materials. Um, it, it, we can be brought back to it, but it takes some kind of effort to remind us. The other thing I would say, and this, this is another thing which was until only yesterday understood. America, which was at least politically dedicated to securing our rights, uh, the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, was also understood culturally to be a people formed by the book. Uh, and admittedly formed not by Judaism, but by Christianity, which took the fundamental Jewish teachings of morality and made it universal, took the universal teaching and in a way promulgated. Tocqueville, when he comes to America, sees here is the incarnation of the spirit of liberty and the spirit of religion, which in other places are at war with each other, but in America are mutually reinforcing, and neither can do without the other. That was the traditional wisdom. That was the world I was born into, and that was the world until it began to fall apart when the elite turned its back upon that synthesis. Well, of course, Leon, that would suggest that one of the defining ideas of the political teaching of Exodus is that a nation is formed by its shared perception of the past, and that by remembering the past in holidays, the calendar is a kind of source of national identity. Ben, the question that we have to wrestle with in America, I think, begins with a recognition that there's a spirit abroad in our land that is hostile to the past. We've just lived through a season in which statues erected to heroic figures from the American past, I'm thinking about people like Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln, were torn down and brought low by an activist class that does not believe in the past or that only believes that the past can furnish us with examples of malice and sin. Well, there's certainly been an attempt over the past century or so in, in the American teaching of history by figures ranging from Charles Beard to Nicole Hannah-Jones to try and turn American history into a story of various types of conflict, class conflict, racial conflict, and to use history mainly as the fuel for revolution as opposed to seeing history as the foundation upon which we build and the, and the recognition that we are standing on the shoulders of giants. And obviously, we've seen the apotheosis of that this summer when people are tearing down statues of Abraham Lincoln and George Washington with the suggestion that they are themselves inherently more moral because we, we now grow, I mean, I'm, I'm living uh, in, uh, I share a generation with people who are apparently the most moral people who have ever walked the face of the earth. They're significantly more moral <laughs> than great people of the past. And if they had been born precisely when George Washington was born, uh, then they would have been full abolitionists and for gay marriage as well in 1776. Uh, it's, a, it's a peculiarity of, uh, of our time that people tend to, that the same people who tend to look at history with the eye of the historicist, that everything is contextually bound refuse to acknowledge that anything is contextually bound when it comes to uh, their own value system, that they actually are building on, on precedents set by others. Um, but can that be reclaimed? I mean, the answer is yes, but it takes courage. It takes people actually standing up for the founding fathers. It takes, it takes people standing up for Abraham Lincoln and understanding Abraham Lincoln. But that in and of itself requires something deeper. And that requires the, the teaching and the, and the implantation of a feeling of gratitude for the past that is completely missing in, in our current context. I think that that is uh, one of the elements of Exodus that is, that is perfectly obvious, uh, is that you, there, there's an attempt throughout the book of Exodus to make the Israelites grateful for what it is they are receiving, and they are continually shying away from it to their own detriment. Uh, and you see that happening in the United States right now. There's this generalized feeling that everything good that exists in American society is the natural way of things, and everything that is bad is unique to America that if it were not for America, everybody would be wealthy, prosperous, and equal. And thanks to the evils of the American system, there are some people who are not wealthy and some people who are not prosperous and some people uh, who, uh, who experience a, a different sort of outcome. 
that comes only from ignorance about history. It comes from an, a great deal of arrogance, uh, and it comes from an unwillingness to look in the face certain realities that that you know are are just present. And and I think that that is one of the messages of Exodus as well, which is that there uh, the, people are not innately completely malleable. I mean, there's no such thing as a as a completely malleable human being, uh, and and the notion that you can you know, just take people out of context and make them whatever you want them to be, or that morality can be free forming uh, and that everything will stay the same. Right? It, it's a bizarre one and it's, and it's dealing from reality. At least the Israelites knew enough to know that if they wanted the prosperity of the Egyptians, they would have to go back to the slavery of Egypt. We seem to be a society that, that believes we can have the prosperity of the Egyptians without any of the detriments. Ben counsels the need here for courage rooted in gratitude for what's given and rooted in the fact that the natural condition of humankind is often the brutal rule of the mighty. Leon, since we are convened by the Jewish Leadership Conference, I wonder, in thinking about courage, I wonder if you can teach us something about leadership, and particularly the leadership that we learn from Moses as he's presented in Exodus. Um, look, uh, there was one Moses. I mean, there have been lots of very splendid uh, leaders in American history, none in my book second to Abraham Lincoln. And uh, I made a vow to myself that when the Freedman statue in, uh, in Washington, D.C. is taken down, I'm out of there. I mean, the, but never mind. Uh, look, um, Moses, uh, Moses has a very special kind of story. Um, He's born to the spirited tribe, the tribe of Levi. Uh, he has an Egyptian education. We're not told what he learned in the palace. He has a kind of curiosity to know the causes, so he goes to the burning bush, and he's converted from wonder and the spirit of philosophy to awe and reverence in the presence of something higher and greater than himself. And it's a remarkable tribute to him at this first opportunity that he recognizes that there's something uh, beyond that summons him and into relation with which he wants thereafter to go. Um, it takes a long time to educate Moses as to what this voice is, and uh, he wants to know its name. Um, but uh, he's told, I will be what I will be. Pay attention, Moses. Uh, watch what I say and watch what I do, that should be enough for you. And it is for the time being. But Moses, Moses has a longing to be in touch with God. And gradually he comes to see that the people that he's leading uh, need different ways to be in touch with God than would suit Moses. And he becomes in a way willing to adapt uh, what he is about to their needs. And so that he, in fact, embraces this people after the golden calf and, in fact, becomes the exponent uh, of the need for the Mishkan, which I don't think Moses had much of an interest in. Very simply, Moses, the people cannot write themselves. This is not a people that was led by a Spartacus rising out of the, rising out of, out of the sl slave, slavehood itself, but rather it took someone of, of not just courage, we meet, by the way, we meet him on the first time showing a spirited opposition to oppression. Fel he has fellow feeling. He takes the part of the underdog. That, that's a necessary condition. It's not a sufficient condition. Um, we see that he, need, that he comes to understand through Jethro's visit that it's not just his own intuitions, but he needs a God-given law to teach to these people. So Moses becomes a courageous leader. He becomes a lawgiver. He becomes a person who embraces this people. And he brings the people to see the power that's beyond them in the light of which, and only in the light of which, uh, they can, in fact, be led to be something better than themselves. The book of the Exodus shows, and this is to pick on something that Ben said at the beginning, and I think it's crucial, and I didn't know this as a young man. It was ancient wisdom, no gods, no city. The book of Exodus shows um, no God, no law. No law, no children of Israel. 
But conversely, no children of Israel as led by Moses, no knowledge of God. And um, culture and theology are upstream from politics. And unless we can sort out these cultural things, uh, we're not going to sort out the politics. Leon, I want to stay with you for a minute. Let me ask you to explain two important features of the law that Moses brings down to the Israelites. Explain to us why the Sabbath and why the commandment to honor mother and father are so important in the formation of a nation. Uh, let me try to do it briefly because it in the book it takes many pages. But um, uh, these are the two positive commandments, the only two positive commandments. And there are echoes of the second table in the existing laws around there. But this, these are the unique Israelite contribution to world morality. Against the Egyptian way of toil up till you drop and work for the accumulation of wealth and the piling up of wealth, by the way, not so much for yourself, but for Pharaoh. Um, the Israelites are taught that everyone in the hierarchy, from the master to the lowest slave and even the animals, gets a day of rest. Uh, not just to watch television and go to the beach and to buy uh, uh, amusements, but to have a day of rest. Why? Because in imitation of God who created the whole world, we are summoned to imitate God in setting apart a day for appreciation, for gratitude. Ben is absolutely right that gratitude is a new way of being in the world, and it's a gift of the Jewish Bible to the world to stand in the world grateful for what is given and to step outside it and to appreciate it. And there is a teaching of human dignity and a teaching of human equality of the highest sort, not of equal possessions, but of equal standing in the godlike appreciation of the world that God has given us. And in the honoring of father and mother, you also you pay honor to the co-creators with God of your very existence. You owe, we owe, we owe them for our very life. But also by honoring father and mother, we introduce into um, what is in other cultures uh, a, a fraught set of intimate and sexually uh, um, fraught relations which could in other places be the den of iniquity and a seedbed of tragedy. I'm talking about the crimes of incest and patricide uh, which uh, were rife in, uh, certainly the crimes of incest were rife in the ancient world in Egypt in Canaan, uh, the, the, the Jewish laws of sexual purity are written against these alternatives, and those alternatives are waiting off stage if we ever lose our moorings here. The Jewish family, which is the instrument of perpetuation and perpetuation not just of life but of a way of life, of a tradition, depends upon that commandment, honor your father and mother that your days may be long upon the earth, that the earth will not vomit you out for the kinds of iniquities that preceded Israel in the land among the Canaanites. This is crucial to any way of life that wants to perpetuate its teaching and not simply live for one's own aggrandizement and pursue longevity and immortality for oneself. Ben, it's a testament to the durability and perhaps the permanence of the human condition that the very same vexed questions of women and men that were at the center of the covenant of Sinai are questions that vex us still. Dilemmas of sex and family formation are really still at the center of our culture wars. How do you see them at this political moment? I mean, frankly, I think that one of the only unifying features of uh, one side of the political aisle at this moment happens to be its orientation directly against traditional institutions and chiefly the family. Uh, th there seems to be very little unifying uh, in, in terms of the sexual morality that is promulgated by the left. Uh, there, there are a lot of self-contradictory notions when, when people say, you know, the phrase LGBTQ, 
Uh, there are a lot of self-contradictory notions. The L's don't necessarily agree with the T's about the nature of biological sex, for example. These are, these are very fraught conversations. Um, but there does seem to be one area of commonality, and that is the orientation against traditional viewpoints with regard to male-female relations and the creation of a family dynamic. Uh, what, what the Bible pretty firmly establishes is the idea that godliness does, in fact, begin with respect for the traditional family and that the traditional family is, in fact, the, the beginning of an education into a, a universe of morality and, in, and a universe of reality, because one of the things that that a traditional family recognizes is the innate differences between men and women. And recognizing the limitations of, of human nature is key to understanding why morality is necessary. If human natures are infinite, infinitely malleable, you don't need any moral system above you. We can just morph you into whatever we want you to be based on screwing around with the, with the social structures under which you live, right? This is essentially the, both the Marxist take on, on how society ought to work because we are all shaped by the societies in which we live, and the intersectional take on, on societies in, in that we are all shaped by hierarchies of, of discrimination in the past. So if we rejigger those, then we will create a better humankind. The family stands in stark contrast to that. It, it provides an alternative to the lie that all human beings are, are going to have no order of preference with regard to other human beings. Uh, it, is a, it is an overt rejection of the idea that there's no natural state between men and women and, and children. Uh, and I think that there's a reason why that has, the why traditional nuclear family has always been the target of, of the revolutionaries going all the way back to the French Revolution and, and beyond. Well, okay, gentlemen, we've talked about a common national story, the embrace of which begins to form a people. We've talked about a law and the way that it structures a society. What I'd like to do now is turn to the third element of Leon's interpretation of Exodus, the thing that a nation looks up to, the thing that it worships. For ancient Israel, as for the Jewish people today, that thing is God, the creator of heaven and earth. And of course, a great many Americans worship God. But for us, corporately, collectively, for us as a nation, Ben, you were speaking a few minutes ago about a higher philosophy rooted in American text and practice. What did you have in mind when you said that? And how do you think it could be recovered? So it does start with God. I mean, the, the reality is that the Declaration of Independence declares that we have certain rights that are predicated on, on nature and nature, nature's God. Uh, and there was a, a fundamental notion uh, that was common to the American Enlightenment, although not to uh, some parts of the European Enlightenment, uh, that rationality was innately connected to, to God, uh, that, that being made in God's image was the predicate for human equality of rights. Uh, and that you need a, a God-based society, you need a, you need a, a stream of history that eventually generates the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is in free forming and free standing, that without a religious background, it tends to fall apart, which I think is a, a fairly, um, not only plausible, but, but, but I think it's a winning argument if you, if you just look at the history of the Enlightenment. Again, it didn't just form out of nowhere. Uh, my, my friend Jonah Goldberg has suggested that it was the, the Enlightenment was the miracle because it's generated so much prosperity uh, economically, but the argument that I make is that it wasn't as much of a miracle as it was a, a progression from a series of rational choices made in conjunction with a belief in traditional Judeo-Christian religion over time, and that the synthesis and the dialectic between those two dynamics led to the rise of the Enlightenment in the first place. That Enlightenment philosophy that was unique to the United States, which, which respected religion, which respected the, the, which unlike the French Revolution, which suggested that uh, the goal was to you know, strangle the last king with the guts of the last priest, there was nothing like that in the American Revolution, which suggested that the rights of Englishmen had to be upheld, those rights originally springing from God pre-existing government. Uh, that was an innately religious argument. Uh, it was predicated on religious, religious fundamentals. Uh, and then built into that idea was the idea that we could learn from the fact that nature was constructed in a certain way, from the fact that God had created us in a certain way, that there were rights that adhered to us long before there was even a government for, for us to provide loyalty to or to, or to defend those rights. So the, the notions in the, in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, the idea that there are God-given rights that pre-exist government, that government is limited in its capacity and is designed only to protect those rights, and that a government that invades those rights becomes a threat to its own existence, and we have a duty and, and an obligation to overthrow it. These ideas of, of the American Revolution, uh, unfortunately, have been lost, but not lost so much as a consequence of people not reading the Declaration and the Constitution as losing the unspoken foundations of the Declaration and the Constitution. When, when John Adams suggested that, that the, the Constitution was written for a moral and religious people only, and that the Constitution without a moral and religious people would be 
essentially burst through like a whale would burst through the, the cords of the net. The, he was right about that. We, we, we failed, I think, over the course of the last particularly half century to inculcate in our kids not only an understanding of the Declaration, but of the far deeper values that undergird the, the Declaration and the Constitution themselves. Well, the Israelites had the benefit of God's signs and wonders, evidence of his manifest providence. That is not so easily accessible to us in America. How do you suppose, Leon, that we, without those things, that we can look up to something higher together? Well, I mean, Ben spoke really both about um, religion properly understood and reverence um, for American founders, for our founding documents. And uh, I think these are two separate, they're interrelated and, but separable um, uh, aspects of both our problem and what has to be addressed. Um, in uh, a very, uh, um, very important youthful speech of Abraham Lincoln, the speech to the Young Men's Lyceum uh, of Springfield, Illinois in January of 1838, Lincoln is addressing uh, a similarly uh, turbulent time um, when people are taking the law into their own hands and he worries about the law-abiding people losing their attachment to the, to the nation. Um, and he talks also about the danger of tyranny on the horizon where they might turn to a strong man, et cetera. And he there calls um, for a political religion, let the reverence for the law, obedience to the law, reverence for the law, the Constitution, and also enacted statutes, be the political religion of the nation. And uh, he doesn't call for reverence for God as, the, as somehow binding us together politically. That's important, but, and, and the political religion is not meant to replace the worship of, uh, of the God of the Bible, but he talks about the need politically that we should somehow come together with reverence for what is uniquely ours as a nation where there is a heterogeneous political worship, uh, religious worship. And I think that there is a way to try, uh, especially in these turbulent times where um, all kinds of people think the law doesn't somehow protect them sufficiently to reinforce Lincoln's view, civil disobedience not exactly civil, and certainly not when you don't have someone like King calling people to purify themselves before they engage in disobedience. One really has to begin to call for law-abidingness as such and stop making excuses for people who find occasions to say, ah, I don't really like this law, we'll get together, we'll show our contempt for it. Get yourself elected, but in the meantime, obey the law, change the law by legal means. But that's not enough. And it seems to me that um, uh, one has to um, call attention to and provide support for the indispensability for biblical religion, not in our national celebrations, but um, in the teaching of the young in their own communities, in their churches, their synagogues, and their mosques, um, the, the cultivation of character, the cultivation of gratitude, these are things that cannot be done simply politically. The home of those things are home and, and, and place of worship. And rather than put these uh, institutions on the defensive and that they have to come begging for, for um, protection of, liber of a religious liberty under the First Amendment and the free exercise, one has to begin to call attention to the fact those places of private worship are the moral strength of the nation. And we've got to work on both of those things simultaneously. Reverence for the law and politics support uh, active support of our pluralistic but still religious, religious institutions. Those are two parallel tracks and we have to work on them simultaneously. Ben, as I said earlier, you inspire, you persuade, you speak into the lives of university students just about more than any other conservative voice. In your experience working with young people, 
What are the kinds of arguments that they find persuasive? What are they looking for? So I think that a lot of university students are, are looking for some sort of meaning. Uh, this goes back to what we were both, I think, originally talking about, is that it seems like we're living in an era where meaning has been lost, and so that's been filled with anger and polarization, and people who are looking for something to motivate them uh, to get out there and, and act. And so when, when I speak to university students and I suggest that they're seeking meaning in the wrong places, that they're seeking meaning uh, in a sense of victimization, uh, and that, that very often they're seeking meaning uh, in, a, in a sense of self-identification that is at odds with reality, I think that, that people, young people do respond to that. That's particularly true when they are facing down a censorious aisle uh, that, that seeks to curb their ability to even investigate problems that they're curious about. Uh, and that suggests that they must be ousted from, the, from, from public life uh, and from the community for even asking difficult questions. Uh, I will say that, that at a certain point, intellectual tyranny does develop this, the seeds of revolt. And I think that that's happened uh, on a lot of college campuses. And unfortunately, that tyranny only seems to be growing worse, not better. The, the question uh, is, is twofold. One, will there be a rebellion in the face of this sort of tyranny? I don't mean obviously a physical rebellion, but an ideological, intellectual, philosophical rebellion in the face of the sort of tyranny that we're seeing on college campuses and which has now infused so much of our, our politics generally. And two, when there is that rebellion, which I, I think will come, is it going to be channeled in the way that Exodus talks about? Because there, the, the, the most famous phraseology of, of the book of Exodus uh, is, is let my people go, but people always neglect the next phrase that they may serve me in the wilderness <laughs> because the service in the wilderness is actually the hard part. The, the, the attempt to achieve freedom from the hand of tyranny uh, is the part that is easy to resonate to. It's the part where we actually then have to learn to restrict ourselves or the part we have to learn to, to live meaningful lives in conjunction with others and, in, and under the boundaries of, of law. Uh, that, that's the hard part and that's the part that, that people need to actually put the work into doing. Leon Cass, Ben Shapiro, for helping us recover the book of Exodus as a text to inspire self-government and to help us rise to the task of American citizenship. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks so much.